Hello, I'm uh, Daniel Gorgan, as you already mentioned. So yeah, as you can see, I'm a backend developer at heart, but uh, yeah, I also had the, the chance to work maybe with some front-end technologies and also I would say maybe a niche domain, the chatbots and voice bots way before actually the chat GPT was a thing. But uh, that's not the topic of today. So I'll propose, um, without further ado, let's jump right into it. All right, so we will start our presentation by having a look on the general architectural challenges, what are the main problems, and how can we theoretically solve them for now. Then we're going to have a look on NestJS, who it is actually and what it actually has to do with uh, all of this. Then we will convince ourselves that is indeed the right tool to, to do so by doing the demo. And of course, at the end, we're going to draw some conclusions. All right. So let me start up with a question. So from your past experience, what are the most common architectural problems that you encountered when uh, developing your Node.js application? Uh, feel free to, to write them on the chat as well so we can uh, have a look and uh, have them in mind and actually try to, to solve as many as possible. I have also prepared the list from my, my previous experience. So. Uh, one of the most common problems that I actually encountered during my day-to-day uh, -day work was that there was no separation of concern. And pretty much this was cause of how the code was developed back at the time. So pretty much everything was tightly coupled together. So every time we were adding up a new framework or changing a framework, we were having problems maintaining the code. So of course, by having everything uh, tightly coupled, it led to some other problems, like uh, the code being hard to be maintained, being hard to be tested. And also it led to some other bad side effects, such as adding external dependencies interfere with my business logic code. So simply changing the database or simply just adding a new framework, it also uh, impacted my business logic code. So sometimes I was causing unexpected bugs in my business logic code where everything I did was just to add an external business. So in an ideal world, we should really, or the business logic code should not really be dependent on the framework. It should be uh, separated. And pretty much to, to sum all of them up, there were no standards and consistency to follow at all. So that's, I think that was the main problem. So pretty much having the freedom on developing something, for example, like using something like Express, it's good, but sometimes it can be challenging as application is growing and, or sometimes it might feel like reinventing the wheel. So let's see how can we actually solve it. So I see that someone already uh, said about the clean code architecture. So uh, let's actually have a look into it. So there are many examples of, uh, different architectural approaches, such as hexagonal architecture or ports and adapters, uh, owner architecture, or as you can see, the clean architecture by Robert C. Martin. So in principle, they circle around the same concepts, but is explaining them with different ways. So let's talk about the clean architecture by, by Anker Bob. So the clean architecture is more of a software design philosophy that promotes maintainability and separation of concerns. How is it exactly achieving that? Well, by separating your application into different layers. Of course, these are the, the four basic layers that the application proposes. You can have definitely more depending on your uh, specifications. So one important thing to actually notice about this diagram are those arrows that are pointing inward. So basically they're saying that the uh, application dependencies should flow inward, meaning that the layers from the outside should depend on the layers from the inside. So meaning that, uh, for example, the, here, the, the blue layer should be depending on the other one, while the, the most central one to be the entity should not be dependent on it. So, uh, I would propose this actually dissect, dissect all of these layers to see what are these actually about. So starting with entities, well, as it's specified, it contains the enterprise business rules. So it should really contain your business object. So and that is usually represented as a class or an interface. So something like a user book, a product, and it's an object that is likely to change whenever we have like a new requirement from the business. So 
be careful, this is not the database there, all right? You can already see some hints that the database there actually resides right over here. The entities is just the, containing the these enterprise business rules that actually the database are going to implement and then do the, the necessary database handling. All right, moving forward, we have the use cases. So use cases is the place where these entities are actually used in practice. So it's basically where our uh, business logic will reside. Then we have the interface adapter. So this is more like an intermediate layer, which is used for uh, validating the data, formatting it, uh, transforming it, calling the specific use case, and then returning the, the answer in a specific uh, format. So that would be the, the long story short about it. And then lately we have the frameworks and drivers, which is more of an infrastructure layer. So basically, it's about how data should be represented. If it should be presented in a way for a database, or if it should be formal for request for a database or some something else like Kafka. So by actually separating your application into layers, then you will achieve this separation of concerns and maintainability. So theoretically, you would uh, have the chance to, to switch between different uh, frameworks or like different technologies without too much overhead, almost to no overhead. So sounds great, right? So what is Nest and what exactly has to do with uh, with this? Uh, how many of you have actually heard about Nest? So uh, let's actually have a look on the, the page. So this is the main page. This is the main landing page. So already, uh, as you can see, it love cats. So the previous GIF selection was no coincidence at all. Uh, that's pretty much why I choose cats. I also love cats, but uh, don't worry if you're a dog person. This framework is definitely for you as well. So stick until the end to, to actually convince yourself. So it also provides um, a documentation page and I found it pretty solid. You got here everything uh, regarding the different techniques, different technologies that uh, you could use uh, with Nest. You got different like code examples that you can use. So I would say uh, before actually jumping into uh, Stack Overflow or ChatGPT nowadays, you most probably are going to, to find the, um, the response already here. All right. So more about Nest. Well, it's a fairly new framework. It was released uh, in just a few years ago in 2016, and it set itself pretty much uh, as a, a framework that helps you building efficient, scalable, maintainable server-side applications. It's doing that by combining different paradigms of programming, such as object-oriented programming, functional programming, and functional reactive programming. Well, if you do have a preference for them, I would already have to give you some spoilers, and that would be that it favors object-oriented programming, but it also gives you the possibility to, to, to mix some of them. All right, uh, I want to do some clarifications before. So Nest is not Next, although the naming is uh, very similar. Next is uh, used more for the... So Next, the right side, is used more for the server side rendering with React while Nest is used for developing more complex APIs uh, with different frameworks integrations. So just to, to be clear. But then we come, we came to um, the question, is Nest something like Express? Well, they serve the same purpose, so pretty much they, they are similar in purpose, yes, but the main difference is that one is opinionated and the other one is unopinionated. What exactly these two words mean? Well, let's take the express example. Probably all of you already know about it and work with it. Well, opinionated means that it doesn't force you to write your code in any way. So it gives you freedom developing your application as you want. So having freedom is definitely not a bad thing, but it can become challenging as, as I said, like the application is growing and it will be hard to be maintained if it's poorly executed. Uh, on the other hand, Nest is coming with an opinionated structure, so it's uh, forcing you uh, implementing their modular architecture that we're going to talk in a second. 
So by having like this uh, standards already set in, you, in theory, you're going to, to avoid having these problems. Uh, just more information, Nest is actually using Express under the hood. So the way the, the requests are actually handled is uh, actually handled by Express. But if you want to use something maybe slightly faster, you can use Configure Nest with Festify. All right, let's have a quick look on some other frameworks. So we talked about Next, we talk, talked about uh, Express, but uh, I included here some other popular backend frameworks like Happy, uh, Festify, Koa, Sales. So we can see that Nest, which will be the orange one, is actually the second most popular in terms of uh, downloads. So um, we can see that only in a few years, he actually gained uh, pretty much, um, it, it, um, it's gotten really popular and we can definitely see the, the interest of people in it. All right, so why is Nest or why Nest actually got that popular? Well, uh, the modular architecture that I was talking about is not really that new. It's actually heavily inspired by Angular. So if you already work with Angular, having you know the modules, controllers, providers, well, everything is also present in Nest. That's pretty much because um, yeah, the guys who created Nest actually worked at Angular and Google before, so why not reuse that? And uh, you will see that it actually makes a lot of sense on the, the backend part. So um, in the same way as Angular, it's using uh, the decorators. So in order to actually annotate all of these classes and also help us in uh, developing our application, and it's heavily using also the dependency injection to to achieve the inversion of control. Of course, the, the benefits of it be, uh, being that uh, we're going to decouple our application, make it reusable as well as more testable. We're going to see it more in practice. And a great thing, it comes by default with TypeScript, which I would say is a rhetorical question. Why is it actually good? Because type, uh, yeah, type safety, so code safety overall. But if you're still a JavaScript guy and you want to use it, you can use it with the help of Babel. Everything is on uh, the documentation page of how to, to set it up. All right. So it actually comes with a lot of built-in modules. So basically, every time you're adding a new framework, you're wondering like, oh, how should I do it? What's the best or what's the, the correct architectural way to do it? So Nest is actually aiding you in this and uh, providing you different, let's say, plugins in order to do different integrations with different popular frameworks. Of course, these are not coming by default. You, you would have to then install, for example, the, the NPM packages if you want to use them. So it came with a CLI, and also, which also has support for monorepos if you're already using it, uh, which helps you in generating the, the files, speed up your, your development, and also takes care of the dependency injection by default, which is great. It also has support. Uh, for different API developments such as REST, gRPC, GraphQL. Uh, it also comes with a plugin for microservices where you could use directly the, you, you don't really have to create like a REST uh, server for it. You can use directly the TCP and the uh, yeah, API gateway and connect everything. It also, they also got uh, examples on that. Uh, support for Arabic Kafka or different databases support with uh, for uh, popular frameworks such as SQLize or Mongo. And of course, they're coming with best practices for testing utilities as well, and not only. All right, so before actually uh, jumping into the demo, I'll propose let's have a last theoretical look on how a Nest architecture would actually look like. So this is a really simple one, something that you really more or less get by using the CLI. So I think you are already aware of um, having your app application separated into controller, a service, a repository. So that's uh, pretty much what uh, I added here as well. We can see that there are a bunch of modules here. So there are some shared modules. We have like user module, product module. So, and all of the Nest application actually have this big app module. So I want to stress a little bit more on this module. So modules are actually a core concept in Nest.js, which are helping us in uh, grouping the similar logic altogether uh, by uh, managing our dependencies effectively and also making our code more reusable. 
and also by separating our application into a well-defined purpose, we're also achieving the, the single responsibility pattern as well from Solid. So, so that's great. That's uh, pretty much uh, how we in Nest you usually structure application. Therefore, you can also reuse it with the, the dependency injection on that. So that's great. Uh, but how exactly is this related to clean architecture? You may ask. Let me actually help you visualize that. So here on the outside, we can see that we got all of the external dependencies, such as databases and uh, an UI in this case. Moving forward, we would have the controller, which would be the interface adapters, which will take the request from the, the React application. It will then call the service, which services will be the use case layer, will contain basically the business logic. And then the service, by using the entities, will then pass to the database. So again, be careful. Uh, entities is over here. The repository is actually the layer or data access layer, depending on how you want to use it is the layer which is actually implementing the database handling. So therefore, it will also be part of the frameworks and drivers. So now one mistake here would be that, hey, you mentioned that, hey, the dependency flows inward. But here it looks like the use case is actually calling the repository, which is actually an outside layer. So that's a problem. Definitely, we're going to take care in the demo. But uh, before, uh, we didn't really talk about this right side here of the, um, the diagram. So here is basically uh, showing a flow control uh, how in the architecture should it really happen. So we have this controller, which would be the interface adapter, interacting with a port and the port with an interactor. Well, if you're familiar with the port and adapter uh, architecture, well, they're kind of similar. So the port would be the contract be between the layers that the interactor would then implement and then return it back to a presenter or a controller, presenter being another um, class or uh, presenting your data in a different format, for example. So we're actually going to take these uh, things with us and apply similar logic for the service and repository. Basically, we're going to inverse the dependency by using um, dependency inversion from uh, Solid as well. So let's actually see it in practice. All right, so I'm actually here in a new project. So we're quickly going to, to generate one from scratch. So I'm actually going to to use the Nest CLI. So since I'm already in a folder, I'm just going to say Nest new. And dot for the current directory, I'm going to use yarn. And we can see that is already generating some files and installing some dependencies. All right. So in the meantime, let's uh, have a look on the, the folder structure. Let's see the model that it has generated. So coming with TypeScript by default, of course, um, it will have uh, the TS config, JSON, and the build. Then you can uh, configure them as uh, as preferred, definitely. A quick readme for actually, yeah, how to to start the application. Okay, let's have a look on the package JSON. Well, you can see that it already comes with different um, scripts for building our application, formatting it. So we can see that it already come with Twitter and ESLint, which is great that we're going to, to use for formatting our application. Yeah. And also for starting our application in different environments, as well as testing. And in terms of dependencies, we have Nest, and as I said, Nest under the hood by default is using Express. So uh, let's actually get rid of that. We're going to use Festify. Reflect metadata is used for uh, decorators, and RxJS is used for the reactive uh, programming, so for observables. And of course, we have some dev dependencies for typings, uh, JS, and uh, yeah, TypeScript. All right, we have the Nest CLI JSON, which um, is the file that we're going to use to, to configure our Nest CLI if needed the preter and ESLint where you can set up your preferred roles. Okay, let's actually go into the file. So this is the main function, is where we're basically creating our application. Here we can see that, hey, we're setting up a port. So we can see already that, hey, we're creating this app module that I was uh, referring before, like being the, the main module. So we can see actually what exactly a module is. So in fact, the module is nothing else than a class. 
which is annotated by that module uh, decorator. And it comes with an, uh, more options that you can, can provide. So controllers definitely be the controllers, so the interface adapters. Providers would be the classes that we're going to inject using the dependency injection. And imports is actually importing some other modules that I was referring like the shared modules along with the exports, which where we can choose uh, which classes to, or which functionalities or providers to export. So let's have a look on the controller. Well, this is a really simple controller. It's just uh, returning a method. So it's by the add controller. And then we have the service, which is then used by we saw by the, the controller here. All right, so uh, the service, in order to make it as a provider, we have to use the add injectable. Let me move it here. Okay, so uh, we have to use the injectable decorator. All right, so let's actually start our application. So that would be yarn start there. Okay, so since we, let's actually add Festify instead of Express. So we're going to add Nest.js Festify and then add also um, another peer dependency. Uh, it's actually platform Festify. <laughs> Yeah. All right, let's wait to, to be installed. So by default, the, the Nest factory and the create would try to use um, Express, but we can now pass other parameter with the new Festify adapter. So let's actually test it, see that it's indeed working. All right. We can already see Hello World, which is great. All right. So uh, moving forward, let's actually generate our first REST API in order to actually see something more more useful. So I'm going to use the DCLA again. So I'm going to use Nest Generate Resource. And to go into the same direction as Nest, let's also use Chats our uh, light motif. So I'm going to use rest. Of course, you can see already you've got like different um, options for, uh, for the, for the other ways of implementing it. I would also like to generate uh, the crude. Yes. So we can see that already generated as a folder. We can see the entities, which will again be the entity layer as in clean architecture. We also have the details which are, uh, which stands for data transfer object and is basically the object that we're going to use to transfer data from our layer to another, in our case, from controller to the service. And again, everything will be bundled into a module and in the same as the app module, it will be the cat service, the cat service is calling the, uh, the cat control, which is calling the, the cat service. So here we have the controller with uh, the name of the endpoint cats. So for example, now, if I'm actually going here and say cats, we can see that it's working. So um, let's have a look on the, the endpoint themselves. So we can see that, hey, for each of the methods, we actually have a, a different decorator. So we can see that, hey, we can already get request arms, or if wanted, we can get the body. And um, Depending on, on your need, you can actually uh, use different uh, decorators. Just as a heads up, in, in S, pretty much everything you, you might need, there is a decorator that might help you in achieving that. So that's already great. So let's actually uh, test the application a bit better and uh, let's add Swagger in order to actually visualize it better. So in order to so, let's add a new package. So that will be the next just Swagger. And let's actually configure it. So just as a heads up, I'm going to by time to time, I'm also going to use some uh, code snippets in order to, to speed up the development because I am really planning to show lots of cool stuff. So sometimes I'm just going to add some code snippets, which are not uh, 
related to the nest CLI or anything like that. They're just uh, pre-generating code. So I'm gonna use this code snippet. All right, so pretty much we, we set up our uh, Swagger, which we then expose it to the Swagger endpoint. All right, so you can see that we already have our Swagger endpoint. Uh, one quick thing that I'd like to do, move these cats to the cats uh, folder here. So in order to do that, I would have to add the decorator, API tags, which would be the cats. All right, we can see also the printer is working. Okay, so we have the cats. Let's actually try it out. They are working. This is uh, nice. All right, so um, let's actually, uh, yeah, further update our API. So let's add some, some parameters into our DTO. So for example, our cat would have a name and would have maybe something like a color which would be string so going here well we can't really see them now because we would have to actually tell somehow swagger that hey we need them so there is api property decorator so by doing so we are actually going to now see them we can also use some other options like uh, example and we can give a cat name like CC and then maybe something like a color. Uh, no, okay, uh, that would be the example of the name. Uh, and then you can also add the description. Name of the cat, for example. All right. So let's refresh. We can already see it's working. Checking the schemas as well. We can see the description is working. So that's great. We already have a swagger. We we can use it the DTO in order to annotate our class, which is great. So we don't really have to uh, handle any open API documentation manually, so this is great, but it can be better. So as your application is growing and you have many and many details, well, this can be painful by having to annotate manually, annotate each of the properties. So it would be great if Nest actually would know this by default. It would be nice for uh, the Nest to actually know um, automatically to detect our uh, code changes and reflect them into Swagger. So we can actually do so by adding a plugin. And the name of it would actually be NestJS Swagger. And I would actually want to add an option here, which is called introspect comments true. So let's restart our application. Let's actually, okay, we got rid of that. Let's see if it's actually working. So we can see it's already working, but what about keeping this backwards compatible? Well, this is actually where the introspect comments is actually uh, coming in helpful. So now we can use comments. And for example, here will be the description. So I can say name of the cat. Then I can use sample. You can already see it's highlighted, which should be CC in our case. So let's see if indeed worked. Well, we can see that it indeed worked, which is great. So we have now our application, it's recognizing the Swagger properties, but still it's not really doing anything relevant. So let's actually add that repository layer that uh, we're referring in the beginning. So um, I'm actually not going to use the CLI yet. So I'm going to manually generate the repository. So let's create the repository folder. Let's add our cats repository so again i'm gonna pre-generate it to fasten up the development so that would be the repository maybe i can zoom out a little bit all right so it's complaining that hey we didn't update our entity because yeah we lose by the entities to insert in the database so let's quickly add them so we have a name which is a string so it's a string and also we're going to have an id when an unique id for uh, each of the entities all right so uh, this is not a real database so in order to not uh, lose any time with uh, setting up the database i'm just using a quick uh, in-memory solution 
So yeah, that's pretty much just implementing uh, everything in, uh, in memory. Right, so let's actually uh, do the changes also in our controller. So pretty much I uh, added here some fine tuning using the repository and also we have the service. Which we can see that he is using the repository. So we can already see that the nest console is actually complaining, right? So it says that hey, it can that that would be the the most um, common error whenever you're not doing the dependency injection right. So let's actually uh, see what's about. So it's complaining that hey, you can't see the cat's repository because we now said that hey, the cat service is now calling the cat's repository to get the information from the database, but it's not really aware how to inject it. So simply to solve it, we have to make sure that, hey, we have the injectable uh, decorator here, which we do. And now we just simply pass it here to, um, to the module. So now Nest will automatically uh, determine the, the type of the class. So basically we are achieving that. So this is great. This is how pretty much the dependency injection is working. So that's pretty much also how inversion of control is working. So for the ones of you who, who don't know what inversion of control is, well, it's basically stating that the control of the classes uh, and the dependencies instantiation should not be dependent uh, on your code, but on the framework. So we are already doing so. And by actually doing so, we're actually able to tell at runtime which classes I want to be added and where. So we don't really have to worry with any conditional uh, checks like, hey, please uh, instantiate this when this class is and everything. So everything is then uh, automatically determined by, by the Nest uh, compiler, which is great. So let's actually see it in practice. All right. So you can see 201 that it worked. So let's see also regarding this. All right, so we can see that it was successfully added in our in-memory in -memory database and it's working. So that would be like uh, a quick and easy way to, to set up uh, a full REST API, but we, so, okay, let's uh, sum it up. We have our cats controller, the cat service, which is calling the, the cats repository, uh, but we are actually running to the problems that we we're discussing before, like calling the cat's repository directly is not actually that good. So this is uh, how it's automatically generated um, by Nest. So it's using the dependency injection. You already maybe recognize it by having the 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 private uh, the variable basically instantiated in the constructor. So we can then switch it every time we need it. And how can we actually solve this problem? So actually let's, let me help in visualizing like the current status of our architecture and how can we actually solve them? Well, um, we discussed about like, Hey, we need something to to inverse the dependency. So if you remember, I was specifying about the dependency inversion. So what is dependency inversion actually saying that high level classes should not depend on low level classes. They should depend on abstractions and not on details. So basically for now we're lacking that abstraction in between. So as you can see also here, there is like this port, which should be like our contract or our abstraction that we then would need to need to be implemented. So I would propose let's actually do exactly that. So basically, so basically I would like to, to add this new interface. So that would be basically our, um, abstraction, which is going to be used uh, by the cat service. And then the cat's repository is actually going to implement it. 
and therefore we actually decoupled the the dependency between the service and repository. Now the service is not depending on the cat's repository anymore. It's depending on this interface. So pretty much everyone who is now or who wants to be used by the cat service have to implement this repository interface. And this is great because now every time I want to switch from my in-memory database to Postgres or Mongo or anything else that satisfies the interface, then I can simply do so. I have to implement this and I don't really have to do any change in our cat service, which is great. So basically my business logic code is not affected. It's untouchable in the way that um, with every new framework that I'm adding, I don't really have to do any changes. So this is great. Let's actually see it in practice. All right. So uh, starting with the cat repository. Well, let we said that, hey, we want to implement like this repository interface. So let me quickly generate it. Uh, the other one. All right. So this is a simple interface. It's using also some generics in order to implement some some common uh, interaction with the database, like pretty much to to implement the CRUD. So we're then going to implement the repository. Okay, it's complaining about needing also the entity. All right. So of course, for now, everything satisfies. For example, if my uh, repository was not satisfying it, maybe, I don't know, maybe I was having uh, another method. So now by uh, actually implementing this, we, we are going to make sure that uh, every time we're going to insert it in our um, service, it's going to be satisfied and we're not going to have any unexpected bugs, which is great. All right, so, uh, um, okay, let's actually solve this in in here. So, um, well, Nest or the, the guys who implemented Nest are not really, or they, they do know how to implement an inversion of controls or and actually is the dependency inversion, but they actually, it's more like a, of a design choice to actually not implement it because in uh, TypeScript, actually in JavaScript, you know that interfaces are not part of it. So when everything gets transpiled from TypeScript to JavaScript, well, the interfaces are not present there anymore. So that's also uh, one of the reasons because they also have like limitations from, uh, from the language itself, but there's no problem. We can actually help, um, the next compiler to, to tell him like, exactly as we wanted to do here. So I want to say like, Hey, service, use something of this interface, which actually has a cat's repository implementation. So we can actually achieve that by using a custom provider, like a simple one, where here we're going to say a token, basically a key of how the repository should be identified. So I want to call it repository. And here we have different ways, uh, from simple to, to more complex where we can instantiate our provider. So we're going to use a simple one, which would be the use class. And I would want to say, Hey, I want to use the cat's repository, but this is still not enough because now the cat service is not aware. It's still expecting something of cat's repository, but we're not inserting cat's repository anymore, but we're setting instead something like, um, um, the repository. So actually I would like to have something like repository cat. All right, but again, this is still not enough because we, we provided that token. So that key, and we also have to, to help here the, the compiler and tell that, Hey, we actually, I want to inject this from the nest environment. So pretty much whenever uh, something is loaded up. Uh, by default, it's singleton, but, uh, that's another discussion. You can also, uh, define it. Uh, you, you can basically change the scope of it. So if you want to be instantiated multiple times or depending on the, on the, the providers, you can definitely do so, but by default, everything is singleton. So everything would be loaded up by the, the nest environment. And we actually, in our module here, we provided this 
key. So now we're saying, hey, take it and use it. So we can see that the application is already working. So let's also test it to see that it's working. All right, so let's try it out. Let's execute it. You can see. All right, so we can see that it's working as well. But now we have actually achieved uh, a cleaner architecture than the, the one that was previous uh, generated by Nest, by also adding this abstraction layer into, into between the, the service and repository. All right, so um, that is great. We, we kind of now have achieved that um, the architecture that we wanted, where everything is decoupled, so we can see that dependency actually flows inward. So now that we fixed that, let's actually do some more fine tuning to our application and uh, show you a little bit of more uh, specific nest ways to do so. So usually you do validation into your application. So for that, let's add uh, two new dependencies. Should be the class validator and class transformer. Okay, so these uh, dependencies are not nest related. Okay, I have a typo. Uh, you probably already use them. So, but nest are actually recommending them. Of course, if you have a, uh, another preferred way of doing so, for example, using something like Joy, uh, you, you can also find on the, the nest documentation exactly how to, to implement it. So, but I will show exactly how to use the class validator and why I exactly find this pretty, pretty great. So I like this approach because now we can actually separate our validation from, from our code and put everything here into our details. So we can simply do so by specifying uh, by specifying uh, decorators. So okay, let me restart the TypeScript. Thank you. All right, so now by simply specifying the creators, I can now put all my validation here, which is great. So let's see that it's actually working. So for example, if I put one, two, three, yes, it's uh, not working because we didn't tell Nest that, hey, I want you to be aware that I'm using the, the decorator. So for that, we're going to use global pipes. And here we're going to create a new validator. Uh, validation pipe. So uh, by enabling it here, uh, the name is suggesting, I'm, I'm going to put it globally, but you can definitely uh, create custom validation pipes for each endpoints if you want to, but for simplicity, and actually not really for simplicity, but uh, a usual way to do it, it will be to actually enable it globally, because usually, uh, everything is unified across the application. And I'm going to also put the transform through flag here. We're going to talk in a moment about it. All right, so now let's test it again. And we can see already you got a bad request with name might be a string. So simple as that, we already have validation. We can now add a really quick validation here. So everything is also decoupled, which is great. So, um, I was saying that uh, I was saying that uh, in our uh, interface adapters layer, we're also doing that other than validation, we want to do some transforming or formatting. So that's pretty much where the transform is actually coming from. So we can use the transform decorator and uh, here to be an object, which we really want is the value and the type of it we'd say okay we're actually expecting something like a string and then i want to do maybe something to lowercase just to see that it's working all right so um let's try it out let's execute it rise and now let me try it we can see that hey everything is still lowercase which is great um okay let's try again with one two three We have a 500 internal server. Uh, let's see what's about. 
Okay, so value to lowercase is not a function. Well, that's because you would think maybe, or maybe if you, I mean, if you don't know how the framework is working, you would assume like, hey, that's because of how decorators are working in TypeScript. So, um, okay, let's move the other way. So the decorators are evaluated top to bottom, but executed bottom to top. So by doing so, I would expect here would be the validation first and then the transformation. Let's see if that's really the case. Well, we saw that it's still not working. That's because the order of the decorators in this case does not really matter because for the class validator, in order to actually use the validation, um, when you first you do the request, the request is nothing but string. So in fact, this has to be converted to a DTO. So this is actually where the class transformer is coming in and then invalidate it. So pretty much the transforming will be done first and then the validation. Of course, if you want to change the, the rule, you would have to, to implement a custom implementation for this. All right. So here actually we did some wrong assumptions that the value in fact is really unknown. So let's use some type guards actually fix this so if the value is actually a string i want to use this if not just leave the value as it is okay so now if we are actually passing one two three we can see that hey the name must be a string because we're passing the value and then the validation is actually is uh, actually happening all right so um we added validation. Let's have a look on um, another common use case that you do, for example, in an express application. So um, adding middlewares. So let's see how can we actually add a middleware in the uh, nest. So here we'd like to, to add a, a middleware uh, for our cats uh, controller. So in order to do so, we have to implement uh, the nest module. So let's actually also implement it. And now we can basically have a look on that one. Now we can use the consumer object. We can apply it. Now here we have to specify a custom middleware that I did not create yet. Um, and then we have four routes. We can specify an array here. For example, if we want to specify on which routes uh, want to be added, but I also have the, the power to use direct the cat controller. So I, I would like to enable it for the entire cat controller. Right. So let's create our middlewares. And then I want to create the custom middleware. I'm going to quickly uh, generate it. All right, so um, it's similar. So that, that would be um, a way of uh, implementing a middle easy classes. There is also an option if you prefer using functions. Uh, I know this is not a really useful uh, middleware, but it's just uh, using a console because I'm proposing instead to have a look at another interesting thing, which would be the request lifecycle in Nest. So why is actually uh, more special because compared to the other frameworks, for example, Express, you have the concept only of middleware, right? You call the, the first middleware, then you pass next, you call the, the next middleware. So in this regards, they are identical. But uh, in the, the next request lifecycle, you actually have a more fine-grained way of actually doing so. And uh, for example, after calling a middleware, you then having your then be going calling a guard. So the guards are really similar to uh, the middlewares. So basically, they behave in a similar way. They're being called and doing some or processing some stuff into uh, before the request. And you would usually do so in uh, Express because you don't have uh, really any other option. So doing like authentication, authorization, uh, guard, validation, middleware, uh, middleware. Sorry. So authentication, authorization, middleware, uh, validation, middleware. But here in S, you actually have the power to, to actually split your code better. Of course, increasing readability. 
uh, so dividing your application into um, more better suited places so it will also be more intuitive to use them but not of the not only this because uh, while using guards compared to middlewares or interceptors um, you actually have access to this context uh, object where you actually have uh, more power of how uh, the controller is actually generated. For example, if you would like to, to implement something like a role-based access a policy, you can actually define custom decorators, for example, and then have access directly into your guards or so not worrying anything about like having a configuration or anything. So having actually more context than just the request and response. And this is great. So we have the pipes that we already seen, and of course the interceptors calling uh, and or pre-processing or post-processing the, the request and the exception filters would be like the, the catcher of the errors. All right. So, all right. So, um, yeah, I can also make a call. Right. Um, actually, I forgot to, I see here red. Actually, forgot to insert it. So, doing just a quick call to to show you that hey, the request was indeed called. All right. So, uh, actually, I would propose uh, let's have a look. Since we talked about guards, I would propose actually have a look on on the guards and how actually a guard would look in nest. So, for for this example, we're going to to have a look. Uh, since we're running out of time, I'm just going to go on the already generated code. So you would, let's see how you would implement uh, something like authorization application in in Nest using guards. So for example, you would have, uh, here I created the, the out module. So uh, it's nothing fancy here. It's just using the JWT in order to, to generate the token, the token and validate it. So um, Having the same module where we're going to insert the uh, the JWT module here will be the controller service, with it, which is just uh, serving a, a login method, and the sign uh, the sign in is for now everything is commented. I, I left some useful comments for you, but for now, just for simplicity, we're uh, just signing the token and returning it. All right, so let's have a look on the the guard itself. So the guards have to implement this can activate um, class where it's exposing this context object that I was uh, referring about. So here we're using to actually get the, the context if we are like using a HTTP REST or graphics, uh, GraphQL or anything, gRPC, so we can have access to a different contexting that we're not really having access to in a middleware. So for now, again, we're just doing some, some simple um, processing here, extracting from the bearer, from the authorization header, and then verifying it using some some secret that we stored in our configuration file. All right, so how do we exactly use it? Well, back to our cats controller. We actually now specify this use guards um, decorator. And by simply doing so, we are now saying, hey, now my entire cat controller is actually protected. So uh, another good thing compared to the middle is now we have like a better way to use and an easier way to actually use our guards. We can definitely, or we can immediately just specify this whenever we want on the, on which endpoint we want, which might be challenging when using uh, middlewares. So, um, that's already a great thing. So we also use the epi bear out in order to actually specify it for the swagger. So as well in the main, we had to specify pretty much the same in order to, to be able to test it. So simple as that. Now we have the guard. The guard is also used um, by the, the cat module. And let's actually see that is it's working. So. Let's start our application. All right.
right so we can see already we have a lock already in here so for example if i want to create a cap we see already that we have the unauthorized uh, error which is uh, as expected so all right let's call the odd we don't have any real validation in here so we did not really store any data to validate it so simple as that we have now the access token now we can go here in our chats authorize the api and now we should be able to actually create it which is fine and then we can now also extract it so it's working uh, perfectly perfectly fine uh all right one last thing that i would like to show you so that's uh, pretty much uh, the repository that is also included on the github as well it also including um, uh, um, different or i would say some bonus features that uh, i didn't really have time to, to present it today so everything is here also with comments so please uh, make sure to, to check it out all right so here lastly i would like to, to present you some some tests so there are some quick tests here regarding uh, the cat service. Let's actually run it, see that is working. So yeah, pretty much the way that we are going to test the cat service or um, or the controller to be the similar. So I choose the, the cat service and pretty much here, what's to notice, uh, we have the create testing module where we're basically gonna create a module similar in a way that we were doing in in our regular module and the nice thing about this is that here we can actually mock or insert some mock dependencies so for example uh, for the repository i did not really had uh, the need to actually mock it this is already in, in my model solution so i provided here like a logger service and i just uh, mocked some some of the the functions here so now then I can actually, for example, since I'm using Jest, I can also spy on them and actually check that they were called, actually. All right, but as you can see here, we're simply calling the, the service, we're validating it, so we did not really test the, the authentication and the authorization because uh, when doing unit tests, we're actually bypassing most of the layers that we did, so we're directly testing just the service. So actually in order to, to test uh, from uh, beginning to end, we are actually going to, to create an integration test and uh, we are going to, okay, here are some examples. So pretty much uh, similar with the, the unit test. And here we're going to use some, uh, of course, uh, some utilities in order to, to generate our uh, testing data so here we can see that hey i did a test where i didn't use the header and the other one when i actually use the header and everything worked all together so these are just some basic tests of course you can uh, further enhance it uh, from now so uh, feel free to to use uh, this um basically this um repo as a boilerplate if you need to i also included uh, some other features like uh, logging uh configuration so feel free to, to use it if um, you'll find it helpful and hopefully you do all right so all right so uh that was pretty much about the demo so i think now we reside to the question like after seeing all of it can do like hey seeing how it is it's interacting with the, the clean architecture is it really worth learning the edges as we saw like hey it's coming with this opinionated structure so it's coming with um, basically a new framework and a new way of doing things so it will of course will have a steep maybe in the beginning like a steep learning curve but is it actually uh helping me in becoming i would say a better programmer i would say yes because yeah we saw like how easy we could implement a clean architecture but if this still didn't convince you i want to show you what the others are actually thinking about it so these are just a few uh, screenshots from some job posts that i found online so pretty much 
uh, one of my motivation as well when learning Nest. So because yeah, we all know Express, we can do our work in Express as well. But I actually noticed like many of the companies asking specifically for Node and Nest. And basically seeing like the power and the, the relevancy of uh, Nest usage overall, like and long term. And yeah, here are just some examples of actually how um, yeah, companies are actually looking for Nest developers as well.